There's a saying that's often attributed to F. Scott Fitzgerald or sometimes Mark Twain. In fact, it's from Ernest Hemingway's 1926 novel, The Sun Also Rises. How did you go bankrupt? Bill asked. Two ways, Mike said. Gradually and then suddenly. Big social and political changes often happen this way too. Slowly, then all at once. Take two recent examples, both around climate change. We've seen Extinction Rebellion organising demos, causing chaos in the centre of London. Every month or so, we see students walking out of school to complain about lack of action on climate change. Will these movements lead to a kind of snowball effect where they will overwhelm our leaders and lead to a fundamental shift of policy towards climate change? Or will they just fizzle out and become nothing more than footnotes in future history books? Who knows? Can we predict? You're listening to Polarise, the podcast from the RSA that's all about the forces driving our politics and our culture further apart and what we can do about those forces. I'm Matthew Taylor. This week on the podcast, How Change Happens. This question of change is an obsession of mine. Sometimes I think it's just because I'm getting old and I, I, I need to feel that the stuff that I'm doing now has got more of a chance of having an impact. Maybe, and probably this is more of the case, it's just that I've spent a lot of my life trying to drive change, working for a political party to get them into power, being in charge of the RSA, working as head of policy and political strategy in Downing Street. And I guess I look back on that and there's an awful lot more evidence of change being difficult, of things not working out, than there is of things lasting. You know, if you'd asked me a few years ago, my biggest achievement would have been to be part of the team that got the government to implement a policy called the Children's Trust Fund, baby bonds for children when they were born. What was the first thing the coalition abolished in 2010? That policy. So thinking about change, thinking about how you make change happen in a way that's irreversible. I was also working in Downing Street when we convinced the Prime Minister to support a ban on smoking in public places. That's a change. No one's ever going to reverse that. So why is it some things stick and other things don't stick? So today we're going to be talking in this episode about change, and I'm going to have some help. I'll have help from Doris Cairns Goodwin, who's an amazing American a historian, and particularly a historian of American presidents and how they did or did not achieve change. I'm also going to be talking to one of my favourite kind of public intellectuals, Cass Sunstein. He's worked uh, for an American president, but he's also written a whole range of books about change. And his most recent book couldn't be more aptly titled. It's called How Change Happens. And I'm also going to be getting some guidance from, well, a kind of philosopher king, Roberto Unger, possibly the person who's influenced me more than anyone else in my kind of intellectual life. So three very different lenses on this question of how change happens. It's um, thrilling to see you and even more thrilling to have Doris Cairns Goodwin with us. What better time? And let's start with Doris Cairns Goodwin. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning author and historian. She's America's preeminent presidential historian. Back in November last year, shortly after the US midterm elections, she talked to the broadcaster, John Snow, live on stage at the RSA. I (laughs) I mean, I've spent nearly five decades living with them, waking up with them in the morning, thinking about them when I go to bed at night. It probably seems an odd profession to spend days and nights with dead presidents, but I I wouldn't change it. (laughs) My my only fear has always been that in the afterlife, there'll be a panel of all these guys that I've studied. (laughs) And every single one will tell me everything I missed about them. And, of course, the first person to scream will be Lyndon Johnson. How come that damn book on the Roosevelts was twice as long as the book he wrote about me? But I figured if I was going to... Although her speciality is the lives and careers of great leaders, change, she says, starts with a movement. I guess the hope I have is that every real change that's come place in our country has come from a movement. I mean, when Lincoln was called the liberator, he said... Um, don't call me that. It was the anti-slavery movement that did it all. 
Um, and that's true. The anti-slavery movement arose. It took years to develop. It then creates the old re- the Republican Party, and then Lincoln becomes the spokesman for that. The progressive movement in the cities and states was there long before Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt. It had already started settlement houses. There was a social gospel in the churches. They were trying to soften the terrible aspects of the Industrial Revolution. And, of course, the Civil Rights Movement was there before Lyndon Johnson. So what we need in our country, and maybe here too, is we need a political revolution. The way we elect our presidents is no good. The congressional boundaries are drawn by partisans, gerrymandered. Um, the money in the system is absolutely the poison. Um, and and there's, you know, there's ways to change those things. I mean, there's constitutional amendments to get rid of some of them. There's changes in the congressional boundary lines. FDR said problems created by man can be solved by man. Um, so I, I guess I'm still optimistic that we've been through worse times before and we've come through them again. Somehow we've got to believe that democracy is not failing. Although I was saying to John, I saw an article in the paper the other day where it said that right now people in America... Uh, they would, a parent would feel worse if their child um, joined the opposite, married somebody from the opposite party than if they were different religions or races. That's how hyper-partisanship things are in our country, and it's crazy. You, you touched on the mechanics of politics when it, when it gets into power. Uh, and, and one of the things I, I wonder whether one of the great disabilities is actually the where politics is done in, in, in the Senate, in the Congress, in our Houses of Parliament. In our case, and I think to some extent in your case too, antediluvian practices still continue. Um, and, and the system is not geared to actually enabling great change to occur. Right. I think that's right. The, our system was built with the checks and balances to make it really hard to get something through unless the country really is demanding it. I mean, even when Teddy Roosevelt came in and wanted to regulate industry and to begin to deal with the corruption of the railroads and to break up big companies that were swallowing up small companies, he couldn't have done that because the conservatives owned the Congress, his party, the Republican Party. But he worked on a deal with the press, and the press were doing all these investigative, muckraking journalism, and the country got all exercised about what was wrong, and then it pushed the people inside. You need the, it's always the people that have to push from the outside in. So that's why there's still hope for me that, that things are getting exercised on the people. And, and, and here too, right? There's been marches. There's, I mean, if you had only had another, what, if you had another referendum now, would it be anti-Brexit? Well, it would be close. It would be close. Wow. I mean, it is said that it would be the other way, but uh, I think there's no evidence of a huge swing. Uh, I don't think I'm right in saying that. There are many more expert people here than I am. But let, let me ask you just one, one other area. Given the way the world has evolved, do you think those days are over when you could ever have principled, uh, articulate, um, you know, coherent... <laughs> no, I mean, no, I know. I mean, the one encouraging thing about the midterms was that my worry has been in these last years that the best people are not entering public life. And maybe that's why we have a dearth mm-hmm. of leadership. They know, you know, their private lives are going to be exposed by the media. They know they're going to have to spend huge amounts of their time raising money. And it hasn't been fun being in politics. I mean, Congress has gotten so little done. There's been so little bipartisanship for so long. Would you want to go into politics? Instead, these same people, as we were talking about, are going into the financial world or they're going in to to make money. But the midterm elections were encouraging because a whole group of new people came into politics because of Trump. They've been so energized. So you had more women by far than ever, ever before, teachers and doctors, people who'd never been in public life before. And you had young people voting 500 percent times more than they did in the last midterm. You had the largest midterm, long-term lines. So maybe the citizens are getting awakened to the fact that they have to take some responsibility because they voted. I mean, not they, but the young didn't vote as much as they should have. A lot of Hispanics didn't vote like you would think they would have. And now they're, they're at energized. So if that happens, maybe we'll see a change. Um, and I don't know, Schles- Arthur Schlesinger said that he had it in every 30 years. In every 30 years, a generation arrives that cares about public life, and then they go back to private life, and then 30 years later, the next generation comes, and they're in public life. So it's been a longer span now than it was before. So I like the idea that change starts with a movement, because uh, it makes it feel as though, in some sense, it's predictable. And, you know, I'm a sociologist, so I prefer the notion that what's going on is the 
a slow unfolding of social processes and structure rather than just a heroic individual. But here's a completely contrasting view of the world. Uh, in this morning's Times, Rachel Sylvester wrote a piece, and what she did was she connected a, a very peculiar event to Brexit. So what she pointed out was that there was a Scottish backbench Labour MP called Eric Joyce, and he had, at that time, a bit of a drink problem. And he then got involved in a fracas in the bar, various accusations were made. He then tried to get served at the bar, went back outside. Um, I followed him outside, and by the time I got out there, he was wrestling on the floor with uh, two police officers. The standard of my conduct fell egregiously below what is required of a member of this House. Why do you think it is that you seem to have been unable to refrain from punching people on numerous occasions. I think there's a natural truculence I've never dealt with. He had to stand down. As a result of that, there was a by-election in Falkirk. And in that by-election in Falkirk, there was a big row about whether or not the selection had been stitched up by the trade unions. Ed Miliband embarked on reforming the party's relationship with the unions after a selection row in Falkirk last year. Individual trade union members should jo choose to join the Labour Party through the affiliation fee, not be automatically affiliated. Ed Miliband worried that the perception was abroad that the trade unions had taken a control of the Labour Party, decided that the way he would respond to this and show that he was a moderniser in his own way was to create the possibility of £3 membership of the Labour Party. How big they are. They're changing our financial relationship with the trade unions and they're also changing the way we elect the leadership of our party. What he didn't realise, but the hard left realised, was this an op opportunity for the Labour Party then to be taken over by a huge number of people who joined for three pounds on a kind of lower threshold of screening, as a consequence of which Jeremy Corbyn then won the leadership of the Labour Party. Things can and they will change. As a consequence of which the Labour Party's position on the Brexit referendum was ambivalent rather than very strongly remain. On a scale of one to ten, Oh, where dear. one is couldn't really care less about the EU and ten is on jumping on the couch like Tom Cruise on Oprah. <laughs> How passionate are you about them staying in the EU? Oh, I'd put myself in the upper half of the five to ten, so we're looking at seven, seven and a half. Ooh, not quite. Maybe seven, seven and a half. You're more, than, well, you're more than welcome to... Quite possibly a consequence of which that referendum was lost. So what we have here is an account of deep structural factors unfolding. And, and you'll read a lot of stuff around Brexit. You've heard some of it on this program, which says, well, what this revealed was people's deep anger that had built up over many years. It's the impact of neoliberalism. Uh, it's a different kind of politics. It's taking place all around the world. Now, that's true. But, you know, Rachel Sylvester is onto something when she says that maybe none of this would have happened if a drunk Labour backbencher hadn't staggered into the House of Commons bar on a particular night. So... How can both these things be true? Well, one person I think who's got some interesting answers to this question is Cass Sunstein. He's been exploring fundamental questions of human freedom, agency, progress. He's brought together insights from psychology, philosophy, economics and the law. He's worked on practical politics. He worked for President Obama on his policy program. He also was co-author of a hugely influential book called Nudge, which has led to countries all around the world using behavioural economics to try to shape social policy and social outcomes. So as I try and work out whether you can predict the world or you can't predict the world, who better to ask than Cass Sunstein? And when he joined me on stage at the RSA just a few weeks ago, that was exactly the kind of question he wanted to talk about. I want to stress the unexpected, often uh, shocking uh, nature of successful social movements. No one sees them coming. Lenin was stunned by the success and speed of the Russian Revolution. Now pause over that. Lenin, an architect of the Russian Revolution, had no idea that it would work. Tocqueville, the greatest authority on the French Revolution, tells us nobody saw the French Revolution before it happened. Nobody. More recently, the Iranian Revolution of 1979 was wholly unanticipated. The participants had no idea it could work. More recently still, the Arab Spring was anticipated by the best analysts in the United Kingdom and the United States. And the best analysts in the United Kingdom and the United States are really good. 
They had no idea the Arab Spring was about to come. It's puzzling but true that large movements, including some that we're in the midst of, and revolutions seem to come in waves. They spread within countries and from one country to another for reasons that remain mysterious. It's characteristic of modern social science to speak of contagion effects, but I wonder if that isn't a metaphor rather than an explanation. So Cass is recognizing that change is unpredictable, but you know, in the end, he, he wants to say that we can somehow get some kind of handle on that unpredictability. He says there are certain conditions, enabling conditions, which need to be there for this kind of tipping point in a social movement to take place. Okay, I have four moving parts in this uh, approach. The first is preference falsification by which people often do not say what their inner self is crying out. The second moving part is diverse thresholds, and I'm going to explain that momentarily. The third is interdependencies. What we do and think is a product of what other people say and do and think. And the fourth and final moving part is group polarization, which helps explain how like-minded people go to extremes. Uh, For starters, with respect to preference falsification, most of us have a bunch of thoughts inside our heads with respect to our workplace, our town, our family, our country that we tell nobody about. Some of those inner thoughts we might be ambivalent about and think they're probably wrong. Some of them carry clear conviction. At most, we will whisper them we falsify in the public domain what we think privately. Second point is that different thresholds for action mean that for some of us, injustice and we're there. If we see something awful, we will say something or do something instantly. Others have high thresholds. They have to be really roused. With respect to interdependencies, the suggestion is that most of us are reactive to what other people say and do. If one person is doing something, calling for social change X or Y or Z, we might think, crazy person. If a thousand people are, we might think, why didn't I join them yesterday? The group polarization point is a simple suggestion that often our preferences and beliefs are fortified and intensified if we're talking to like-minded others. And that can create a kind of social whoosh, that's the technical word, W-H-O-O-S-H, exclamation point, when like-minded people talking to each other end up in a more extreme position just because they're like-minded people talking to each other. If we put these points together, the difficulty, indeed I'd say the impossibility, of anticipating social movements becomes far less puzzling. We don't have to talk about contagion and influenza. The four factors just discussed, I'm going to suggest, tell us somewhere between 90 and 98 percent of all that we need to know to answer the puzzles with which I began. Why are large-scale movements or revolutions so hard and maybe impossible to predict? First, we don't know what people's preferences and beliefs are. By hypothesis, they can't be observed. Second, we don't know what people's thresholds are. They too are unobservable. People may not know their own thresholds. Third, and I think most decisively, We can't anticipate social interactions. Who will say and do what and when? Even if we could identify people's preferences, for example, by looking at Google searches, and even if we could figure out their thresholds, which I think is really challenging, we still wouldn't be able to know in advance the nature of social interactions. These points suggest that even if with the aid of new technology, it's increasingly possible to identify private preferences, we still will have a a very hard time predicting social movements. This is 
helps, I think, account for the tentative suggestion, which is social movements, including the election of President Trump, various things that are happening in various nations right now, are unpredictable because they're often a product of serendipitous, random, or seemingly small factors of who did what when, who heard what, at what time, and whether some kind of butterfly flapped its wings at the right moment. So one of the things I love about uh, that account, Cass, is that it's a bit of a poke in the eye to big data, isn't it, really? Because uh, the kind of big data enthusiasts, who are like the early sociologists, like saint I mean, you know, the, the founders of sociology, they genuinely believe, they call it social science, because they genuinely believe that you would be able to predict social movement in the same way as you can predict the movement of atoms. It's poppycock, isn't it, really? I mean, you know, you can have all the big data in the world, but you ain't going to catch the fact that a butterfly flapping its wing is going to lead to a social revolution. Completely. So there's uh, a question which is related to what you just said, which is why is it that experts can't predict cultural success very well? Harry Potter was turned down, I think, by 12 publishers. How, that's their business, to make money, sell books. They didn't know. How can this be? And the, the big data just doesn't tell you. And studies of cultural success and failure suggest that if you get a bunch of early popularity, if someone says this is great and tells someone else and tells someone else, then the thresholds can add to social interactions. And then you can have Taylor Swift. Now, she also happens to be great, Taylor Swift. Can we agree on that? <laughs> but but the, her greatness is not sufficient. And you couldn't predict from data crunching that da Taylor Swift would become Taylor Swift. It, it, it's, it's butterflies and who is talking to whom exactly when. And in fact, I guess, whilst people are saying, well, big data makes it easier to predict, the, the, the way, the speed with which information moves actually makes it less easy to predict because a phenomenon like Me Too can 45% of the population can be aware of it within 24 hours. I mean, you know, pre-internet, at least you could kind of s sort of see this stuff happening in real time. Now it's happening at the speed of light. Yes, no, that's great. And I think probably we want to distinguish between those uh, uh, social changes that depend on social interactions, which are... I think, I think it's, it's too weak to say there's an empirical challenge we're not able to meet. I think it's right to say that there's a conceptual problem that we're never going to, going to be able to meet, which means we can't predict that. Now, whether someone in a population is likely to commit a crime, big data is kind of helpful on that, or whether a student is likely to do well in school, given certain characteristics. So there are some prediction problems that are uh, more tractable now than they once were, but there's an important class that involves social movements where we probably can do a bit better. We know from Google searches some things about what people care about that we wouldn't otherwise know, and that can give us um, clues, but, but not laws. found Cass's ideas fascinating and I have to say slightly disturbing this this idea that there are kind of tacit norms preferences in society just waiting to be articulated waiting for a trigger to turn into a social movement it made me really think very hard about what those might be and you know some of them are good things that one might want to surface you know rage about inequality or climate change but others you know others it feels to me slightly more frightening and in particular makes me think about the really deep cultural divides that exist in our country between norms in, on the, I don't know, on the one hand, a university campus, and on the other hand, on the kind of terraces of a, at a football match. So maybe we'll come back to some of those questions on a future programme. Cass Sunstein's the author of two new books, On Freedom and How Change Happens, and you can watch his full talk, which was brilliant, uh, on the RSA's YouTube 
uh, channel. So CAS is a class act. Uh, can we go even higher into the kind of pantheon of intellectuals? Well, we can. Uh, because uh, my next conversation about change was with uh, a hero of mine, Roberto Unger. The years. Roberto, thank you so much for finding time thank to you. talk to us. Um, he is uh, a kind of intellectual titan. He's written a whole number of books. He's advised a variety of uh, governments. Uh, one of my favorite books called The Future of American Progressivism, he co-wrote with Cornell uh, West. And I I've come up against Roberto many times over the years. And uh, he's a great figure, but he's also pretty intimidating. Um, he really knows what he thinks. So when I went to speak to him about his book, The Knowledge Economy, I kind of knew I was in for some Ungarisms, these kind of great statements he makes, which are like a kind of, you know, it's like a blast of wind. You think, oh my word, what a thing to say. I wasn't to be disappointed. For over 200 years, the world has been on fire. There has been a revolutionary project in the world. This project has two sides. One side is the political side, carried by the doctrines of democracy, liberalism, and socialism, uh, opposed to the entrenched systems of social division and hierarchy that have beset most societies in world history. The other side of this revolutionary project is the personalist side, carried by especially the worldwide popular romantic culture and its message that the ordinary person is not so ordinary after all, and that we all become more human by becoming more godlike, by ascending to a higher form of life with more scope, intensity, and capability. This project remains the most powerful project in the world. It continues to command the agenda. In another sense, however, the project is weak as well as strong because its votaries no longer know what its next step should be. Neither the political agenda nor the moral agenda of humanity. Uh, I, uh, my life happens to have fallen in a counter-revolutionary interlude in this long revolutionary period in the history of humanity. And I determined early on that I would not allow my ideas and efforts to be shaped by the biases of this counter-revolutionary <laughs> interlude. Uh, and thus, uh, one of the fundamental motivations of all of my work, including this recent book, is to find the ideas and means by which this revolution could go on and the fire could continue to burn in the world. Uh, and that explains, then, my attitude. So when you look at trends towards kind of political polarization, the rise of populism, pessimism as well, people's growing kind of pessimism about the future, do you view these as things which are likely to become worse and lead us to uh, a crisis, or do you view them, in a sense, as, as opportunities for the re-emergence of that kind of idealism? So the last great moment of institutional and ideological refoundation in the rich North Atlantic world was the social democratic settlement of the mid-20th century, the American equivalent of which was Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Money is an inadequate social cement. The only adequate basis of social cohesion is direct engagement with other people, forms of collective action outside the boundaries of family selfishness. These low energy democracies that we have in the world, they continue to make change depend on crisis uh, and thus to perpetuate the rule uh, of the living by the dead. So the basic rhythm of European life uh, in the 20th century was that the Europeans awoke when they were at war, slaughtering one another. And then when peace was reestablished, they fell asleep again and drowned their sorrows in consumption and have not been able to find a way to be both at work and at peace. None of these problems can be 
solved within the established boundaries. We need to rediscover the structural content of public life. The liberals and socialists of the 19th century understood the progressive cause as having as its goal uh, the ascent of the life of the ordinary man and woman to a higher level. The goal was a shared bigness. Mm. It was not the humanization of society, but the divinization of humanity. But you, you called it the larger and, life for and, all. And the method that they proposed was structural change. Now, their vision of a shared greatness was too narrowly molded on the model of an aristocratic idea of self-possession. We have to have a larger, more magnanimous, and more contradictory view of what this greatness consists in. And their method succumbed to a series of institutional dogmas or blueprints in which we can no longer believe. So we have the unprecedented task of reestablishing the structural, structural vision without succumbing to a structural dogmatism. And therefore, a larger and more radical experimentalism, an ability to reshape the structural background of society in order to become bigger and to achieve what should for all of us be our largest goal, which is to die only once. Last question, because I know we run out of time. One of the other things I love about the book is, is that it reminds me of the themes of your work over these decades that I've been uh, uh, following you. For example, uh, encouraging progressives not to focus on symptoms, but to focus on underlying systems. Uh, a focus on the importance of institutions and institutional renewal and institutional invention. The importance of, on the one hand, having a mobilizing vision of an alternative society, but on the other hand, mm -hmm. a willingness to be agile, experimental, and pragmatic about how it is we embark upon that road. And if I tell you the RSA has a phrase, which is my reinterpretation of that final point, we talk about thinking like a system and acting like an entrepreneur, is, our, is a phrase we talk when we think about change. Yes. To what extent, Roberto, do you see that those methodological insights that you've been arguing for so long to, to progressives, to think in these different ways? Do you see evidence that progressives are doing that? For example, in the new left, in the Democrats, in ideas like the Green New Deal, do you, do you sense that the, the Unger methodology we have a fundamental is, is making progress? We have a fundamental confusion in thinking about change. If, if I propose something that's distant from what exists, you say, that's very interesting, but it's utopian. If I propose something that's close to what exists, you can say, it's feasible, but it's trivial. So whatever can be proposed is likely to be derided as either utopian or trivial. That results from a misunderstanding of the nature of transformation and of a programmatic argument. It's not about blueprints, it's about successions. And it's not architecture, it's music. <laughs> now, then that false dilemma is aggravated by a feature of the history of ideas. Contemporary social sciences are, for the most part, each in, its, in their different ways, rationalizations of the existing arrangements. They have no structural imagination. We did have an old form of structural imagination the classical European social theory, such as Marxism, which, however, misrepresented the nature of structural change because it compromised with a series of fatalistic illusions. One of those illusions is the idea that there are these systems like feudalism, socialism, capitalism. Each of them is an indivisible package. And then we get this idea that Politics is either the reformist management of a system or the revolutionary substitution of one by the other. Then the unavailability of the revolutionary substitution becomes an alibi for its opposite, which is the management of the existing order, its humanization. That's the characteristic position of the contemporary progressives, the, the humanizers of the inevitable. 
And that's not how structural change is. It, it is fragmentary, but it can nevertheless become radical in its outcome if it persists in a certain direction. If we think in the bad old way about structural change, we can't understand it. And not understanding structural change, we then embrace a bastardized criterion of political realism, which is proximity to the existent, which is absurd. And that then brings us back to this false dilemma. So here's a problem that we have, that the, the, the high culture of the academy is all hostile to, to the structural vision that we need. The hard positive social sciences are rationalizations of the existing order. The pseudo-philosophical disciplines of political theory and legal thought are wedded to the humanization of the existing order. And then the humanities are embarked on a roller coaster of subjectivist adventurism, <laughs> dissociated from the reimagination, remaking of society. So they pretend to be enemies, but they're allies in the disarmament of the transformative will and imagination. So we don't have the ideas that we need. And we have to produce them along the way, in the, in, in the midst of this storm. And we need this imagination, uh, and we, we don't have it. And so it, we, 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 the task of this programmatic rethinking is the immediate provocation to the development of a different way of thinking about society. And this whole argument is, the, is a set of variations on that theme. How we become more human by becoming more godlike and prepare ourselves to live in such a way that we die only once. Thank you, Roberta. Roberto Unger there with some classic Ungerisms. He didn't say, actually, perhaps my favourite one of all, which is from the Cornell West book. They said something along the lines of, it's not hope that leads to action, it's action that leads to hope. Well, that's it for this episode of Polarise. We'll be back again in two weeks' time when Ian Leslie and I will be joined by Elizabeth Oldfield from the think tank Theos to talk about the influence of religion in our politics or maybe the influence of a lack of religion in our politics. If you've enjoyed this episode, please tell someone about it and we'd really appreciate it if you left us a rating or a review in your podcast app. I've been Matthew Taylor, the producer was James Shield and we were brought to you, as always, by the RSA.